What is the new apostolic reformation and what do they believe? This is People of the Free Gift, where we ground believers in their identity in Christ and equip them to reach those caught in religion. If you're new to this channel, go ahead and click that subscribe button. We put out content related to the cults and how to share the gospel with them several times a week. And so let's go ahead and jump right into the question, who is the New Apostolic Reformation and what do they believe? And of course, all of this material is coming out of my re recently released book, Sharing Jesus with the Colts, available on Amazon as paperback or Kindle. And so New Apostolic Reformation was a term that was coined by C. Peter Wagner, who uh, until his death, it recently was um, noted as kind of the key central figure within this movement. But the, the movement didn't really originate with him. Just kind of that terminology and some of the organization came after his leadership and uh, after this came into to being. Uh, one thing I'll say right off the bat about this group is that a dangerous sign of any kind of movement or group is when key figures within that movement deny its very existence. You can do a simple Google search, YouTube search, whatever, and you can find tons and tons and tons of material about the new apostolic reformation. And you can even find a site in which you can register and apply to be an apostle and meet their requirements and be named as a modern day apostle or prophet and yet the key leaders and figures and scholars associated with this movement deny its very existence. That is a very, very scary thing. And because of that, there's a lot of people, Christians, who are going to churches that are affiliated with this movement but they have never heard the term and they have no idea. There are a lot of um, de pastors who maybe are a part of denominations or you know organizations that are affiliated with this movement and they have no idea. There's maybe a lot of pastors who are under a different category who are influenced heavily by books and, and materials and teachings written and put out there by key leaders within this group and they have no idea. And so this is a it's scary group. It is larger than you could even imagine. Um, and, and so I wanted to talk about it today. Its roots, the new order of the latter reign in the late 40s and early 50s, uh, were kind of the origins in the beginning. This idea that there was going to be a latter reign of the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, which is kind of, it goes back in that sense to early Pentecostalism and those revivals that were going on at that time. And so some have identified it with the third wave of Pentecostalism that was started by John Wimber in the 80s in the Vineyard Movement. And so, and I, I heard recently Bill Johnson in an interview talking about uh, his association with John Wimber and an experience related directly to him. And so uh, I, I think that that's fair enough. So the distinctives of this group, there's uh, several, and so we're just going to talk about them briefly. The five-fold ministry. What this is, is an allusion to Ephesians chapter 4, in which God says, and God gave to the church first apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists, for the equipping of the saints um, for the work of the ministry. And so they believe that all of those categories ha need to, in every age, be in full swinging operation. Meaning, and the, the two most controversial ends of that are apostles and prophets. This group believes, and hence the name, New Apostolic Reformation. This group believes that there are modern-day apostles. And yes, we are talking about the same sense as the Twelve. Now, they would say that they're distinct and separate from the Twelve, but they still believe in very real sense that they have the same kind of authority uh, to do certain things as govern the church, reveal new truths through revelation that's given to them, 
and advance God's kingdom on earth. And when they, they reveal new truths, they very much believe that they are speaking prophetically in the same way as the Old Testament and New Testament authors of Scripture. And so they, when they say advance God's kingdom of on earth, we're going to get to that in a second. But prominent names and locations, uh, maybe you haven't heard of this movement, you don't know much about this movement, but if I threw out some names like the International House of Prayer with, you know, I believe that's Mike Bickle, but I'm not sure, Bethel Church with Bill Johnson, Rick Joyner, Mike Bickle, Todd Bentley, Lou Engel, Cheon, or Kim Clement, uh, you would um, maybe resonate with that. If, you, if I threw out the term Bethel Music, um, maybe that would resonate a little bit more. And so the second distinctive is unity. And when they say unity, it's not unity in the core essential doctrines of Christianity. It's not just unity in the mission that God, that Christ gave us to make disciples of all nations. They believe that unity is required uh, in the church. And the, when they say unity, it's unity to the authority. They teach something called covering theology. And covering theology, uh, you may have heard that term as well. Uh, what that teaches is that every believer has a covering over them. And so, you know, like wives would submit to husbands and husbands are submit to submit to Christ. Or, and, uh, you know, like a person in a church would submit to the elders and the pastor in the church. A pastor would submit to the local or the, the closest uh, uh, a modern day apostle and that modern day apostle would submit to you know higher ranking apostles and so on everybody has a covering and it's not just that you know they're you know submit to their authority but they they believe in a very real sense that you know that person has the ability to speak into your life on and make major decisions for your life and for you to step outside of that covering is to step outside of the provision and protection of God and to really fall outside of the grace of God if you really want to get down to it um, and so they use that for a lot of abusive practices that have been reported and the reason why I'm including this group in my book and talking about them in the terms of a cult is because of the, these abusive practices, not even so much in what they believe. Because the truth of the matter is, when you really pin it down, and they use this as kind of a defense, their doctrine is not really that unsound. And so I will say that for them. They have some eccentric practices. Um, but it really comes down to these abusive teachings and practices that um, make it really dangerous. That the strong central leadership idea, and as well as some other things that I go through in my checklist of, you know, you might be a cult if. So let's get go ahead and get into this some more. So extra biblical revelation would be the third distinctive. And... Along these lines, you know, I, I mentioned that, you know, they're apostles or the prophets, and they believe even, you know, ordinary believers can receive divine revelation, that God is still speaking today in that same sense, uh, that the canon's not closed. I think they would very definitively say that. Um, and that these words that are received are put on even a greater par, I would say, than Scripture, uh, because they would say the scripture was spoken to that day. These are words are speak, spoken to this day. And so one of the manifestations of that that's come out fairly recently is Brian Simmons, a leader within this group, felt he was directly called by God to create a new translation for this age. The problem is that he did not do what translators do. First of all, any one individual who is um, translating the scriptures right off the bat, I would be just very hesitant about that. If they're putting it out there as like, no, this is a new translation of the scriptures, um, that's really dangerous. 
because what he did is he didn't necessarily go back to the originals um, and then translate the way that the other translations did. He very clearly is paraphrasing, um, just like the Message Bible or the Living Bible, they're paraphrases. And what happens in the paraphrase is that you are not even concerned with rendering the words of the text. You're just concerned on you know, trying to convey the meaning and put it in a language that's understandable to such an extent that you're actually just really not even paying attention to the original words in the first place. You're really just trying to put something out there. So what comes out is that person's belief, especially, again, if it's that one person, it is that person's belief. And so this translation very much reflects the teachings of the New Apostolic Reformation. So it is no different than the New World Translation for the Jehovah's Witnesses or the um, Clear Word Bible of the Seventh-day Adventists. Okay, they're, they're paraphrases uh, and they're intentional attempts to put the theology of the group into Scripture. And that is a seriously dangerous thing that is going on with this, within this movement. So, going on from that, one of these revelations that was received was the Seven Mountain Mandate. And when they say we have the power, the authority to advance God's kingdom on earth, and I just heard Bill Johnson quoting, he said that, you know, Jesus taught us to pray, your will be done on earth even as it is in heaven. That's literally what they believe. They are very post-millennial in their, their, their eschatology. They believe that the church needs to establish the kingdom of God on earth and then Jesus will return. So very different than what a lot of people believe in regards to that. And so this revelation, the seven mountain mandate, was that given that um, the church needs to reclaim the seven main areas of influence in the world. And those areas are government, media, entertainment, education, business, family, and religion. So... They don't believe that, you know, Christians should just believe the right things and practice the right things if they're a Christian in the midst of those things. They actively encourage and believe that Christians should occupy these medias and that eventually that Christians will take over these mediums. And I remember when I was in college, and I had no idea what this was. And it was a very compelling speech that was given in a chapel service. This woman was comparing this idea to Lord of the Rings. And when it was really popular, and, you know, the, the, the five rings, and she was comparing it to, so she condensed it down to five. But she was really making a push for this very thing that Christians need to get back and take back the media and take back the, the political realm and take back this and that. And I, 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 now I understand what it is that she was doing and referring to. And it's really actually a scary thing that the gospel for this group has become more about gaining power and influence in the world than it is about saving people with the gospel message that Jesus died for their sins and rose again from the dead. And you know, there's very little emphasis on the word of God, very little emphasis on on the gospel within this group, and a lot of emphasis on miracles, on the supernatural, on uh, experience, and uh, modern day apostles and following them and leading them and influencing the world and kind of taking over the world. And ultimately, the, the next distinctive is supernatural signs and wonders. Uh, how, how much do they believe this? There is a teaching within this group of the manifest sons of God, meaning that they believe that their, their leaders will become so powerful one day that they will not even die. They will even conquer death. They call those the manifest sons of God. They believe that there's going to be this great end time transfer of wealth. There's going to be this great end time harvest, a great outpouring of signs. And they have emphasis on dreams and visions and extra biblical revelation. And they, they emphasize that even more than they do the Bible. 
claiming that their revealed teachings and reported experiences, including trips to heaven, face-to-face -face conversations with Jesus, and visits by angels. Um, so yeah, that, that's this group, and they have some distinct terminology, and which I detail in the group that you need to know about um, if you're going to um, interact with people in this group. And so I want to know what you think. Is there something that I mentioned that you'd like to share with the group? Is there a question that you have about this group? Do you have personal experience with this group? Are you in this group? Um, I would love to hear from all of you in the comments down below. Let me know what you have to say. You know, I'll be taking some of those questions and interactions for my weekly, you know, Q&A at the end of the week. And uh, so if you haven't already, click the subscribe button and give us a thumbs up on this video. If you like the content for today, share this video with other people in your lives who are trying to reach out with the gospel to those caught in religion. And until next time, may God's grace be with you.